When we return to our planet, the High Court may well sentence you to torture. Well, hey, 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 it is the last vlogcast for 2018. Yes. So all of you fellows, fellow gamers, fellow movie lovers, fellow lovers of physical media and all the media beyond, enjoy the show. And he's not even drunk yet. <laughs> no, no, no. This is early on. Of course, it should post by this evening. But yep. hopefully you will be able to enjoy the New Year's countdown with us as we yep. go into the next vlogcast. Mm -hmm. I like how you adjust the camera, even though no one's actually going to be... <laughs> um, you know, you have a very good point there. Yes, a very good point. <laughs> but uh, we've got a lot to cover. I'm yep. talking fast moving fast because we got to get fast yeah we got a lot to cover so uh why don't we go ahead and talk about what we have been doing over the lately okay it's been a couple of weeks since we did one of these and um in which time of course christmas happened so that's a big thing <laughs> yeah yes it did uh i don't really have a lot of watching matter of fact i've got no watching no watching oh just watched well, Lots of watched. I so. have multiple watchings in oh. different states of being. Oh, yeah. <laughs> just just go through go through your continuing, your starting, your all that. Do okay. it all. <laughs> now the started watching is closely related to one of the finished watching, so I'll go ahead and do that. <clears throat> I have started watching the second series, Heartthrob. In the franchise Love, Chunibyo, and Other Delusions. Uh, it is a fun series. Gone beyond me now. It is a fun series. I'm probably going to hold off until I finish Heartthrob to do a in-depth analysis. <coughs> but the basic gist of it is you have this guy, Yuta, who in middle school, he was a full-blown Chunibyo. Which, if you're not familiar, Chunibyo is sometimes translated as 8th grader syndrome or middle school syndrome, or whatever. Basically, people who have some issue facing reality, <laughs> they have, to put it bluntly, overactive imaginations. And he went by the moniker Dark Flame Master. And when he started high school, he wanted nothing more in the world than to never hear that name again only to find his upstairs neighbor <laughs> is a full-blown chunibyo herself uh her name is rika takanashi and she goes by their name the wicked lord shingen and eh, things happen they end up assembling an assortment of kooks who are in some way shape or form related to the process of chunibyo it's a fun series. It's really beautifully animated. It was a Annie production. Mm. Really cool. Heartthrob is so far is more of the same. From what I've heard, it very much is more of the same, which actually was supposedly it um the series saw some progression in season one and kinda of stalled after that. But Yeah. The only yeah. thing I've heard about the second season mm -hmm. and I need to get into it is that people mm -hmm. were frustrated, they were hoping for a lot right. more progress in the romantic relationship between the leads, which yeah. uh, apparently looked like it was going somewhere, but right. of course does like any anime. Yes, and that was particularly a, a, a complaint about the movie Take On Me, which came out recently. Um, but anyway, that's pretty much as far as my started watching that covers that. Um, I guess I'll go ahead and mention the started reading as well. I read the first volume in the Rebirth series of Teen Titans, oh. and it included one of my favorite moments yet in any of the Rebirth series. The um, 
Unfortunately, the Robin in this Teen Titans is Damian Wayne. Yeah. Fucking little bastard. But because it's Damian <laughs> Wayne, Rachel Ghoul and the uh, League of Assassins uh, are featured prominently in this story arc where the Demon's Fist trainees like Damien who are wished to become part of the League uh, each target an, an individual and fan out looking for them. Damien knows who the targets are and assembles them and they are the Titans and the one who is uh, for various reasons things turn out differently and Raish gets very pissed. Um, but there's a dialogue where some of his minions are going up against Plague, who is the one who was supposed to go against Raven. Hmm. And Raven does her thing, and the guy disappears. And Plague's like, did you banish him to some hellish dimension? And Raven's like, close, I teleported him to a McDonald's restroom in Kansas. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. I thought that was amusing. <laughs> but, um... Yeah, and the other thing I started reading, there is no way to talk about this without acknowledging that it is a political football. But I have started Bob Woodward's book, Fear, Trump, and the White House. And it's oh. very interesting. It's very informative. Um, yeah, I'll leave it at that. <laughs> oh, well, uh, I do have a... I actually have a reading. Yeah. Nothing started... Mm -hmm. uh, but something that I have actually started, well, been reading, which yeah. I've been continuing K-On. Uh -huh. uh, I so want to read had, that. And theoretically, I, I have had one started. Yeah. I forgot about it because mm -hmm. I've been continuing my, my Fallout 4 play, yeah. which I finished the Far Harbor DLC, which is kind of cool. You're on this foggy island, and it's radioactive fog, and you got to work towards uh, trying to help all these factions get along with each other or destroy them, whichever you want to go with. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> and I ended up trying to bring them all together this time instead of destroying them. The first time, I just killed everybody. Hmm. As I want to do in Fallout. <laughs> but I really do it because they have some really good armor there, and uh, so hours and hours for a piece of armor. And now I'm doing a quest that's hours and hours for a pistol. Oh, good times. But, uh... I am playing Smash Ultimate, and I've been playing Smash Ultimate lots because I'm trying to, for tonight, get as many characters unlocked as possible, and I got a decent number. Cool. Alright, anything else in your... As far as uh, current watching or started watching or yeah. whatever? Mm -hmm. Now everything else is watched, but there is a fair bit of that. Um, okay, yeah, I've got right. a, I got a large amount too. <laughs> now, one that I know you could have actually put on watching, actually, um, I did, and I'll just go ahead and oh, mention yeah. this. I did finish off Gravity Falls season one finally. Yes, I don't know and why I forgot about that. Had some good times. It, it, it is a good show. It's a fun show. I enjoy it. I'm looking forward to season two. And uh, as far as the ongoing, I have done some more with the shows I'm ongoing, CSI Friends, and for the first time in probably two months, I'm guessing, I actually watched some episodes of Cat's Eye the other night. Oh. Yeah. I'm going to try to get back into actually watching that one. <laughs> I was thinking, I know you started a while back, yeah. so it definitely doesn't count as started. I guess starting yes. up again. Yes, yeah, starting up again. As far as watched, it was primarily Christmas stuff. A lot of Christmas stuff. Oh, yeah. A lot of Christmas stuff. I didn't even include any of the Christmas stuff. Charlie Brown watch, Christmas. Yeah. It's Christmas time again, Charlie Brown, which I actually oh, don't wow. think I'd ever seen before. Oh, wow, yeah. Um, Love Actually, White Christmas, It's a Wonderful Life. And I did manage to to fit in a viewing of Joy Noel. So that oh. was a, I love the part at the end where they mentioned that the cat was accused of treason. <laughs> 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 the cat was indeed the best character in that. <laughs> he didn't play as big a role as I remembered, though. Hmm. I've left out the Christmas viewing because it kind of went as sort of a, um, a I don't know, guerrilla warfare style. <laughs> um, I got it in as I could. Uh, yeah. Most of my time was spent trying to move through all those films. I got for a twenty dollars set. Oh wow! Of horror films. So you probably have a lot more to list than I do. You can wow. see, I got a long list. Holy crap! 
Um, I'll list three just to, uh, actually, yeah, I'll list three of them right now just to get off of that. Uh, there's Mutant Man. I'm going to list the ones that don't really have much uh, my attention. Mutant Man, <laughs> which is sort of like a slasher monster killer movie. Um, Gates of Hell Part 2, which I can barely remember anything of. I mean, really, it wasn't all that great overall. Um, yes, White Christmas, which is definitely a, uh, mm-hmm. a horror movie of, oh, yeah. um, of sorts. Um, and uh, Death by Dialogue. Okay. Which was a part of a, um, a trauma trilogy along with Play Dead, mm. which, again... I don't remember a lot of it. When I don't remember it a lot, it just doesn't... I mean, to me, I don't really consider it worth much. Um, and that's where I'll end it for the time being. Because okay. it has stuff to say. All right. Well, um, you may end up having several in a row. Uh, <laughs> one that I did manage to watch, I'm about 98% sure that this was during this viewing time... Um, actually, I know it was, because the last time I think I said I'd almost finished the Rebecca bonus features. Oh. Which I did. All that was left was two radio plays. And they the first radio play was actually took place in 1938. And it was an RKO production, Mercury Theater, directed by Orson Welles. Hmm. And Welles played the main role of Maxim de Winter. And it, it was really well done. It was really interesting. Um... The second two, which were the only bonus features I still had to watch after last time we met, which I did watch in the meantime, were more based off of the movie because they came out after. And the first one actually had Judith Anderson, who plays Miss Danvers, reprising her role. And the second one had Laurence Olivier reprising his role of Maxim de Winter. And with Vivian Lee playing the main heroine of the movie... And Lee was someone they really wanted for the movie, but no one really thought she was right. They just wanted her for the star power. Yeah. So, of course, Mm -hmm. she came back and did the radio play later on. Um, They're interesting. It's an interesting way to to experience the story. Um, And I'll go ahead and count that as one just because you have so many to list. (laughs) And I did finally make a Rebecca video. One day it will be edited and posted on this channel, but it is recorded. <laughs> See, what you guys got to do is we need to get enough people so we can start making money, and then he can actually get a computer that yeah. can do editing, and then you'll see his videos up in a timely fashion. Mm-hmm. Or maybe get mine before my computer breaks uh, to that point, too. Um, I'm going to go through this one uh these two are together but these two I actually do have some stuff to say about I'm actually I took one off because we're going to discuss that in our in like 10 films that we're talking about later so ah. I figure might as well take those off if there's any mm-hmm. um, there was a film called rock and roll Frankenstein <laughs> which uh, is a interesting film I'm debated I've debated I debated whether I would be offended or amused. And I know that there are many films like that out there. Essentially, what they do is this guy who's a manager, he is like, I am I am really upset with all these people wanting money from me for their talent. So he gets with this guy that he has some sort of blackmail on, and he has him take body parts from famous musicians like... Uh, Elvis's head and uh, <laughs> things like that, and the the problem comes when it gets to the nether regions, because they're looking for Jim Morrison's, <laughs> but they end up getting um, gosh, what is the piano player? Abby something. No, what, are the, <laughs> what is the piano? What's the piano player? The um, the one, the sparkly piano player. Uh, the sparkly piano player, Elton John. No, not Elton John. <laughs> um, in that in that line, like really, like uh, was really famous back in the day. Yeah, okay, Liberace. That's that's it. Uh, they got his instead. So 
he, he learns to do really well and gets really famous, uh, but he has this conflicting nature with all these other ones like uh, Desires going up against a very empowered uh, mutant uh, Liberace uh, thing. Uh, and people die in ways that I can't discuss on a YouTube channel. <laughs> Jesus. Oh, jeez. So, yeah. Uh, with that being said, it was a very entertaining film. But one that I could see is very uh, potentially dis offensive. What do you think? In many ways. They actually have to fight it at the end. Yes. Uh, <laughs> but it's very, very worthwhile. Uh, while you're talking about your next one, I'll get it out so you can see the cover. But uh, uh, there's also uh, Hellblock 13, which is an interesting, it's an anthology uh, by this, uh, this person is on death row. And she says, well, I wrote this group of stories. And she tells the execution of these stories before she goes on the long walk and it is a very amusing one hmm. I'm not going to ruin these uh, for you but they're very dark and disturbing and uh, they come from somebody who might be considered somebody who's going to go off and get killed for doing evil things so uh, I thought it was very good to listen to and to me it, I love anthology films because you could have a number of bad ones in the anthology but you could have but the chance of having a good one is still very high. Mm. In most anthology films, there is at least one segment that I really enjoy. Mm. All right. So. <laughs> well, on the uh, <clears throat> on, on on the probably the different end of the scale in terms of uh, quality and class and whatnot. Oh, I mean, no uh, class. <laughs> um. <laughs> I, I did get one of my Criterion films watched this week, and actually this one only had a very small amount of bonus features. They were good, they were well done, but they were a very small amount. So I actually completed this one and also filmed a review for it. And the, uh, isn't that something? Okay. Um, but I did... Yeah. I did watch the 19... Uh, no, no, the 2014... Uh, German film Phoenix. Uh, Christian Petzold, I think, was the director. Uh, this was like one of those ones. We always complain about films that are too new getting the Criterion release. The film was two years old when Criterion put it out. It, they did have some really good bonus features, but they only had like three of them. And it was all like making of, you know, brand new. There was nothing about the historical impact of the film because there really was no historical impact of the film at the point that this release came out. But Phoenix is a very intriguing film. It, uh, it actually, I think it's based on a... I think it's based on a novel or something. Or like, the story apparently has been done once before. But it's a very rare example of a German film set in Germany right after World War II. Hmm. Which is very rare. And you have this woman, uh, Nelly, who is a former cabaret singer who has suffered some disfigurement to her face. And she also is a survivor of Auschwitz. And she returns to Germany looking for her husband who the person who is with her is like, no, don't bother with him. He's a, he's an ass. He's the one who turned you in. You know, and she's like, he divorced you. You don't want to go back to this guy. And, and she does anyway, because, you know, what's she going to do? She's, this is the 40s. Yeah. She didn't know any better. Um, she finds him, and he doesn't recognize her. She's had facial reconstruction surgery. Most people who look at her know who she is. This guy looks at her and is like, you look like my wife, but he's so convinced that she's gone, it doesn't click for him. So he ends up in, enlisting her in some weird Hitchcockian plot that she goes along with because she loves him so much, uh, where he's trying to get her to pose as herself, 
to get her inheritance, which is sizable. Oh. And she goes along with it. And it's very noirish. It's very colorful for noir, but it's very noirish. It does have a Hitchcockian feel. It's a really interesting movie, but there's some weird stuff that happens. And I don't want to go into it because I can spoil it. But I will say the ending is pretty awesome when you think about it. But at the time I saw it, I was very disappointed. Because I wanted it to go one way, and it goes in a different way. And the ending, it also seems very abrupt until you really think about it. Um, so it's it's artsy, let's put it that way. Um, <laughs> I could see why the film was chosen for Criterion. And it's not a bad film. It's worth watching, but be prepared that it will not end the way you probably expect it to. <laughs> So now here's one that came with the set and was one of the ones that caught my eye, other than the mm. trauma stuff, and that's Evil Tunes, which is huh? out of print. And uh, the guy who came in here, he was uh, for this. He wanted to do a horror movie in the vein of Roger Rabbit, where you had the cartoons interacting with live action. And so essentially, it's one of those where a group of people find an evil book, they read from said evil book, evil comes to destroy them. How evil deadish. Um, and the creature is a sort of cartoon, but mm -hmm. you only see it as a cartoon at the beginning and at the end. Mm -hmm. So to me, I don't really feel like they got the whole of it. Because mm -hmm. most of the movie, the, person, the, the, the creature's possessing someone. It was okay. Mm -hmm. It was not the greatest horror film I've seen. Mm -hmm. Matter of fact, nowhere near the greatest. Yeah. But... Considering the difference in potential importance, mm -hmm. this one's somewhat important to the horror community, especially those who like B-horror, mm -hmm. but otherwise not really important to the art community. Though one could say, argument-wise, that B-horror movies are art, and those that follow them are people who love art. In their own way. In their own way. <sighs> so... Uh, I will leave it at that. Uh, I will come back with my next one. Okay. I, I gotta remember what it was about. <laughs> well, the last one I'm gonna talk about is one I revisited the other night. I don't think there was anything else from the last couple weeks. I know on Christmas Eve, my brother and I started watching Willy Wonka, but we only saw about 20 minutes or so of it. Uh, I've seen it before. It's a classic, you know. But um, the the one that I did revisit a couple nights ago was I did get to watch my copy of Ant-Man and the Wasp. And Ant-Man and the Wasp is a very fun movie. It's very good. If you've seen the first one, the second one is kind of the same but more. Uh, and in some ways that's really good and in some ways not as much. Um, the villains, such as they are, are not quite as compelling as... Um, I thought Corey Stoll did a wonderful job as a villain in the first one. He, he, he total nut job. Um, but the daughter is hilarious in the second one. She's absolutely hilarious. And uh, overall, it's really well done. It's really good. It's the other Marvel film this year. It's kind of sad, but it really is. But uh, that kind of tells you something. If they're able to have a movie like this, it's this good. That's yeah. the other one. <laughs> Uh, you know, there you go. So, I got a lot more to cover, but I'll try and cover it as briefly as I can. Mm -hmm. uh, I watched a, F a Kubrick film that we, we talked about and mm -hmm. uh, discussed, one that he does not like very mm -hmm. much. Uh, I need himself. to see this one. And this film is called Killer's Kiss. It is out of print. Mm -hmm. And I got this MGM DVD of this relatively uh, cheaply. You, mm -hmm. you all may see it in pickups one of these days. Um... And it is a film noir. It's one of his first. It is not his first. I think it's his second film. Mm. And it's about this boxer who gets involved with this uh, woman who is under a mob boss. And he's spending most of this film to try and protect her from the mob boss. Mm. There are a few things that I thought were interesting and Kubrickish, such as the film, such as the scene with the mannequins. Uh, and the boxing scene was one of the few that I remembered. But for some reason, a lot of film noirs just 
go over me. I, I don't know. I get bored and I zone out. And this was no uh, no difference. I mean, heat was like that for me too. I kept zoning out. I I remember heat was about like water or something. Not to mention, I remember I put him to sleep with Chinatown. Yeah. <laughs> was Chinatown the one about water? Yeah. Or Chinatown was the one. That was about the one water. about water. So you know, again, I don't know what it is. Uh, the film noirs have that way of doing it to me. I'm still looking for that mm. one. I guess the, the one that's like going, yes, that's is the great one. <laughs> <laughs> then they, we go into a trilogy, which is a trauma trilogy. Apparently there are seven of these trilogy sets. I'm not going out collecting them. But uh, there are three, and they're interesting. I will go least interesting to most interesting. The least interesting was Zombie Island Massacre. Essentially, a bunch of people go to this island vacation, and uh, these people, they do the old school zombies. You know, the Haitian style zombies? Right. Uh, which is an interesting take. You don't see a lot of those type of zombies in zombie films, so that's interesting. But the rest of the plot was very Scooby Dooish, including the reveal at the end. Is that sort of like I would have gotten away with it too? If it weren't for you, <laughs> meddling kids. You uh, kids. The next one that was interesting was Blood Hook. Blood Hook is just a strange concept, and I love strange concept movies. This movie is about an individual who is a killer. Hmm. Uh, certain things just drive him off the deep end, no pun intended. Uh, and he gets his fishing rod, and he has a human uh, allure on it. So he uses the fishing rod, and he fishes for humans. And he uh, kills. Okay. Yeah. It, what does he use as a lure? It just looks like a big old buoy that he throws out. <laughs> so he ends up killing people with the fishing rod, and then you know, uh, keeping them in storage like you would fish. I could see like they had like a hundred dollar bill or something on there. Some of the some of the parts would be difficult for you to see uh, because there are some like where he takes the. Uh, you know where you would take and you gill them? If you ever, you've done how fish, you, you gill them, you do that, and you put them on the line together. He does that with the, with the people. Hmm. Uh, but other than that, it's still not that bad overall. Um, and it was very entertaining. But the most entertaining was Blades. It takes place on a golf course. And these people are being chopped up. And nobody knows who the killer is. And if you want... Uh, I will give you a, uh, take twenty seconds and uh, and I will um, and you'll miss the spoiler. But this is just too good. It's a killer lawnmower. Yes. <laughs> no, nothing behind it. it it's possessed. <laughs> so kind of like the lawnmower in Frankenhooker. <laughs> So next up on my list is something called Mommy's Epitaph, which is very, very disturbing. It's about this uh, couple, um, and, that, and they have a you know full family, but Mommy is a bit unhinged, and she basically kills her family members one by one until the very end, which has a twist ending, and I won't spoil it if you want to do it. But I keep thinking throughout, it's like, when is she gonna get her darn canuppins? Why are they coddling this woman? <laughs> but they are. Uh, I said I'd leave out the holiday stuff, so I'm going to leave that out. One day your uppins will come. Uh, I saw one movie that was uh, has a lot of buzz around it, which is Bird Box, which is the new Sandra Bullock film. That's a Netflix release. Bird Box is essentially an adaptation of The Happening. We don't know what the monster is, but something is making people kill other people. Hmm. But not only that, it's possessing people as well. Certain people are possessed, and they go around trying to have these other people exposed to this source that gets them killed. And it only happens if you see the monster. Seeing the monster is what 
kills you. So they try and get you to take off your blindfold and all this stuff. And they're mm. going around with that. And you'll see a lot of memes with Thunder Bullock and the two kids with blindfolds on and uh, going by. Like there was one I saw of uh, the three of them with the blindfolds walking past one of those people ringing the bell at the uh, front of the building, stuff like that. One with her in a Ninja Turtle mask. Uh, and in general, I'm sure that's we'll see more and more of that. It's got mixed thoughts. Some people hated it. Some people loved it. I thought it was okay. <laughs> it definitely had. It was definitely better than the happening, but that's not a high bar, now is it? <sighs> now, finally, last night, a movie I'm going to review. I just need to watch it with the commentary. It's a short film called House of Rathiticus. It stars Kyle Rappaport, which uh, we have uh, we've had on inside movies galore several times and uh several other people that i don't know and i i actually enjoyed this film i was thinking to myself oh crap i hate when i'm on talking terms with somebody they want me to review something and i see it and i'm like this is crap but this was not uh, this was not the case i did enjoy this film it's going to get a decent review but i am looking forward to what's coming up with the special features so mm -hmm. i can you know get an idea mm -hmm. as to what's going on with it yeah um that one's about like a possessed mask it's also sort of an evil dead-ish type thing you know read an evil book but this one possesses these masks which turn into monsters there's one scene i think is really good it was a dream scene where um where it actually legitimately has a slight scare to it and i don't mm. scare easy uh and uh kyle was a, a really good at acting i uh, when you when you see him in his YouTube channel, and you actually see him act, he's able to portray himself very differently, and that tells me that he does have a lot of skills. So uh, if you haven't checked it out, go on Amazon, get get a copy. <laughs> How would you say that one is as far as uh, oh, gore? Oh. No, not not for you. Uh, they they did a really good job with the special effects. That's going to be a, a very for what they're doing, I mean, this is like like student level, right. like budget wise. So what they did with this is very good. Uh, very good. So, um, but uh, I know you wanted to talk about some of the deaths. Uh, we haven't really had time to do standalones, so we'll probably start giving out like significant ones here. Yeah, it seems that that channel uh, that the the, 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 the video series. <laughs> That's all I was trying to say. That video series may be uh, no more, but we'll we want to do continue doing certain shout outs and there were two that have happened within the last couple of days that definitely needed note. There have been several since we last did deaths. Um, unfortunately, I don't think we may have mentioned Bernardo Buttelucci and some of the others, but uh one, uh, two that I definitely want to mention. Don Lusk uh, passed away a few days ago. He was 105. My God. <laughs> an American, American animator. He worked, he basically was Disney. Uh, In-house animation was, it was with Disney for about 20, just over 20 years, I think. He worked on, among other things, Pinocchio, Fantasia, Bambi, Cinderella, Alice in Wonderland, Peter Pan, Lady and the Tramp, Sleeping Beauty, 101 Dalmatians, and yes, Song of the South. Um, Say what you will, but Song of the South was significant. Well, yeah. And it's time. Oh, and actually there was another live action hybrid that he worked on that I has been totally forgotten in the passage of time. I can't even remember the title offhand. Um, and then, I don't know what happened, if Disney and he parted ways over style, or if he simply got a better deal. But 101 Dalmatians ended his Disney run, but then he went and did a whole bunch of stuff for Hanna-Barbera, and a large proportion of the Charlie Brown peanut specials. So this guy worked hard for a little while and had some really impressive credits. And he was one of at least three people who have died in the past week who was 100 or more. 
which I guess is evidence that people are getting older. He died too soon. Which is something you wouldn't really say in this case. Well, maybe. I don't know. Maybe he thought he did. <laughs> one who did die too soon, because they're going to have to recast a character in one of my favorite anime, uh, among other reasons. Um, Toshiko Fujita, a 68-year-old Japanese voice actress, died of breast cancer this week. She, among other things, played Korsan Muto in Allison and Lilia, and had multiple roles in Inuyasha, Dragon Ball, One Piece, Fist of the North Star, Digimon Adventure, Outlaw Star. She had a lot of big roles, but the two notable ones. As I said earlier, I just went back and started rewatching Cat's Eye. Hmm. The main characters who form the, ba- the, the criminal group of Cat's Eye are the Kisugi sisters, and the eldest one, Rui, is was voiced by Miss Fujita. Hmm. And the other one, the one that's going to have to be recast, there may be some others that will yeah. too, you know, and there's the ones like Dragon Ball and One Piece. But in Chihaya Furu Season 3, the Empress will be played by a different character. Taiko Miyauchi, a.k.a. the Empress, is the... Uh, faculty advisor to the Karuta Club in this show. And Miss Fujita did a really good job with the character, and I like the character. It will be a shame that they have to recast that role. But um, that, again, she had some very notable credits, and I just wanted to go ahead and mention that, because, I mean, again, Chihai yeah. Furu, Alson and Lilia, Dragon Ball, I mean... There's some really impressive stuff there, so, uh, yeah. Oh, so, big, yeah. so many big yeah. deaths. Over the last, mm-hmm. like, three weeks, we've yeah. had a ton of significant deaths. Mm-hmm. You should take a look. One of the places we typically mm-hmm. would go is there is a Wikipedia page that lists mm-hmm. all the ones they can find. Yep. Usually not a lot of the Japanese ones, which is sad, uh, but uh, they do catch a number. They do get listed, but they tend to get listed late. Yeah. And usually Anime News Network will list them as soon as or sooner than yeah. the wiki page. And Anime News Network does do a good job of catching them. But Most not of, good for catching American actors and such. <laughs> but, but yeah, but I... I <coughs> Whoa, sorry. IMDB, Internet Movie Database, is really good for those, definitely. Um, but yeah, the, were there any of them that jumped out to you? or those uh, are the, I can't remember. Okay. Uh, yeah. I try and stay away from it. Uh, yeah. When I get down, I have a harder time with dealing with a lot of the deaths, and yeah. seeing a lot of deaths mires me. Yeah. Uh, but uh, I have a couple of news items before we mm-hmm. get to our last bit. Yeah. Not a lot. Um, one of them is Me Too, and one of them is Comeuppance. I think you have a Me Too news story, too, don't you? I have a couple that could be considered Me Too and Comeuppance in some ways. <laughs> so uh, one of them uh, is an article that came out, and again, it tells you just how long it's been since we've done this. Right. Uh, you've seen it. The article came out on Woody Allen uh, oh, yeah. with the uh, woman that you know, did the tell-all about them having three sums when she was 16. Yeah. Um. And many people are saying, well, this is proof that he raped the uh, child at Mia Farrow. I was like, well, how is that proof? Uh, it's but, considerable circumstantial and, and much. Evidence. And on, this, yeah. on the same time, it's th- that doesn't show anything there either because 16-year-old is very different from, say, younger. Now, I don't... Yeah. To me, people ask, so does that make you want to stop watching films? Like, no, it really doesn't do anything but just confirm that, yes, he's a creeper. Uh, I agree. Uh, Mia Farrow also was involved in these threesomes. Not many people talk about that. Uh, But she was talking about how she did have full involvement in this Mm. as well. And she had one other weird thing to say, which is that she has no regrets, which is very strange. Yeah. I'm not... I I would have regrets. Uh, And again, uh, this, and there's comparisons to Polanski, Mm. but I think Polanski, she was 13, the girl? Yes. So, again, it's really debatable. It's not good. Mm -hmm. I don't like it. I don't think, I think it is creepy how he does that. But at the same time, it's that separation between art and life. Mm Mm-hmm. 
Uh, there are lots of creepers out there. I still have a, Pol a Polanski film or two in my collection. I don't care for the man. Only two? I don't know how many, actually. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, I, mean, I know you have some Polanski in your collection. Oh, I do. Oh, I do. Yeah, actually, we were just talking about what Chinatown was saying. You know, that was Polanski. But uh, I feel like that was something that needed to be brought up. Yeah. Uh, again, there's no more or less facts involved in the other case, the Dylan Farrow case. I mean, there's so much conflicting stuff. Mm -hmm. And the moment I see it, I'll admit, the moment I see that there is proof, I will be glad to say, yep, yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just get rid of all my Woody Allen films and chuck it. Because I don't, I do not, I do not sanction any type of child rape like that. That's right. that is just not that's not there. Um, but mm -hmm. uh, a lot of things, you know. I mean, it's a lot of conflicting. I mean, two of the children have accused uh, Mia Farrow of being uh, physically and emotionally abusive mm -hmm. uh, to the point of like uh, should have been reported to child authorities. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, nobody bats an eye at that. Which I think is sad because, again, if one is worth investigating or trying in the court of public opinion, I think mm -hmm. the other as well. Mm -hmm. uh, psychological and physical abuse is a terrible thing. Mm -hmm. But I've got no proof of that, so I'm not going to say she's guilty of it either. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but that's, that's my say on that. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know. Are you ready to chuck all of your Woody Allen stuff yet? Well, I'm going to be honest. I and this is one thing that I'm a little conflicted about, but I'm very unlikely to cut anything because of someone's private behavior, or even in some cases more public. But um, now Kevin Spacey is the one that's got me on uh, the edge. yeah. I've been, and we'll talk on him in just a moment, but like. Again, this is like one. If you look at the works as a whole, now with Woody Allen being the writer director of most of his films, they are mostly his films. But there's a lot of people involved. There's mm -hmm. a lot of talent involved, and it seems very, very much a shame to throw it all out the window because one or two people involved ruined, you know, the. Yeah. And and so and we're one of the reasons we're big into physical media is the idea of sort of preserving these things and keeping oh, them yeah. around. And so I hate to be the the reactionary, the the book burner type, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, but on the other hand, like you said, you don't want to sanction it, so I'd probably hold off on getting more or yeah. that, you know something like that. And similar with Spacey, I'm very conflicted about getting anything he's I mean, involved I've, in. Yeah. But I'm not likely to throw out what I already have. I mean, but, uh, a good example, yeah. uh, Song of the South. We were yeah. talking about that just earlier. Mm -hmm. There are films, and to me, I don't see any reason why Song of the South can't be re-released. Mm -hmm. If Birth of a Friggin' Nation... Yeah, how many releases has that had? ...has had multiple releases and remasterings. Yeah. Birth of a Nation was an important film. Mm -hmm. It showed a lot of... A lot of talent. It wasn't a good film. Uh, it was a nasty film. Right. But again, well, Disney wants to pretend that Walt Disney was yeah, a yeah, uh, yeah. good guy. Uh, <laughs> Disney wants to pretend that they've never done bad, yeah. and that way they can be judgmental. But there, but there's a good example. It is well known that Walt Disney was not a saint. Oh God, no! <laughs> You're not remotely. But at any rate, speaking of people who are not saints, two of the people who are ensnared by the Me Too movement have really, really shot themselves in the foot this week. <laughs> and Kevin Spacey was one of them. If you, that video? If you, have not, oh, if you have not seen that video, you got to watch that video. Oh, my God. He essentially played Frank Underwood, his character from... House of Cards. He doesn't say it explicitly, but he essentially did. He just, out of nowhere, he posted this video of him preparing a Christmas dinner or something as Underwood. And it's well done. It's well acted. He does, But the thing is, the things he is saying, given what he was accused of, Given the fact that within hours of the video being posted, a criminal indictment came down for him. Yeah. Uh, he, oh my God, this was like professional suicide of the highest order. 
I don't know if he did it on purpose or not, but he has committed professional suicide. I don't think he will ever work again at this point. Or at least not um, in anything that's going to. Yeah. Because you know, his last film just... His last film made about a hundred and some dollars at the box office. Um, 600 I think, was the total. Um, yeah, that was bad. And then almost as bad, this morning I read that Louis C.K. is still out hitting the stage and said some very inappropriate things that given the fact that he is still needs to do damage control big time, he probably shouldn't be diving into these particular waters right now. Yeah. <sighs> Louis C.K. is just in a tenuous position. Yeah. I'm surprised at how much he has put himself back out. Yeah. And there is a level of forgiveness that he has gotten... But he's squandering it. He's squandering it. Yes. And that's just kind of weird. Because he, he did some really sick, messed up stuff. And yeah. let's not discount that. He did some things that no one should do. He made people incredibly uncomfortable. He really, really, really crossed the line with some people. But... Where, if you look at overall personality and everything, I mean, Spacey just comes off like a douchebag at this point. But CK just, he always seemed like such a nice guy, you know? He, he just was a little bit of a pervert who didn't know how to control himself. A little bit? Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. But, <laughs> in, but if you look at that, he had room for image control for... Yeah. Uh. And he is just completely ruining that well, possibility. I mean, so. this is the thing. Yeah. To me, if they are guilty of this stuff, I think yeah. they should go either go to jail or I think they should career yeah. Kevin Spacey does not deserve to keep up with his career at the yeah. point that he's at now. No. Uh, Louis C.K., I don't know what's wrong with you. And the thing, the thing yeah. of it is they're both so talented. I and mean, it's, oh, it's Bill too Cosby bad. deserves to be in jail. Yeah. It's... Mm. I mean, to me, that's how it is. And I agree. If you get... Now, if Woody Allen is nailed and they've got definitive proof, I'll be the first in line to say he belongs in jail. Yeah. Now, I agree. Burning physical media or burning something because it doesn't meet the present day's narrative or getting rid of it, that is not the way to do it. You learn from this stuff. Yeah. There are still good things, and there are many people who have worked on a lot of these films. Yeah. Look at the credits list. Does it say uh, when, let's say K-Pax, give me an example of one I really liked with uh, <laughs> yeah. Kevin Spacey. Uh, did, did the, when you saw the credits roll by, did it say Kevin Spacey and then that was it? That was the end? Uh, it would be a very short credit sequence. It would be. But it's not. It's like a, lots and lots yeah. of people. So, and in a way, it's good to see how these people are and how they present and what good has been accomplished. Bill Cosby. The Cosby Show, I still have a copy of it, even though he's a monster. I mean, I'm sorry, but uh, he's been found guilty of all of that. Yeah. And, but at the same time, I cannot deny the importance that show has had on many people. Mm-hmm. And that is something. Yep, something. So it, it really is when you got art. If it's just one artist, yeah. it's real easy to deal, but you've got so many people involved in the film industry. Right. But schadenfreude news, <laughs> Soldier Boy is back. <laughs> when we last talked Again. About, yes, when we last talked about Soldier Boy, he had put up all of these clone consoles with ripped games. You know, like Super Mario Brothers and all of that. And he was selling them. And he was, you know, strutting his stuff, saying he's making millions of dollars on these things, and he's going to start his own e-gaming team and all this stuff. And, of course, these people, YouTubers and such like myself, hammer him, say, you know, that's illegal. Nintendo ain't going to sit by and let you right, peddle their right. stuff without getting a piece of the pie. And he's like, y'all nerds ain't nothing but bundles of sticks. That's what he called uh, nerds. Which you'd think uh, that he's trying to present himself as a gamer, you wouldn't want to, you know, insult the people that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Presents himself like Ogre out of the Nerds movies. <laughs> and, uh. Then on top of that, he says, Nintendo ain't got nothing on me. I ain't afraid of Nintendo. 
Well, apparently Nintendo decided, oh, you're going to be afraid. You're going to be very afraid. Oddly enough, he has moved to Dubai recently. Interesting move. All of those game consoles have disappeared off of his store. And if you look up the Soldier Gaming website that he put up, it redirects to Nintendo. Now, Nintendo has a peculiar way of trolling those that they have taken down legally. They seize their websites, and they redirect them to their own website. So that tells me Nintendo has been taking action. We just haven't heard about it yet. And they threatened as much publicly. <laughs> so I know they did. And my guess is that Nintendo has already started the takedown. And I'm sure Soldier Boy is a little bit afraid. <laughs> now, I don't have a lot of sympathy for a man who makes fun of those of us gamers, nerds, whatnot. But I don't want him to do jail time. I just want him to understand that you can't get away with doing stupid stuff like this. There was potential. One of the things he was looking at was this thing called the Fuse. That was the new one. The Soldier Game Fuse. Now, this was a Chinese console that was built around the time that China was legalizing consoles, and they were trying to get into the market. It's a fairly decent power. It's about the same power level as a Switch, and uh, has wireless charging, which is kind of cool. Hmm. Uh, the always online aesthetic is kind of iffy, especially if you decide to leave it at the Chinese, uh, the Chinese servers, which would go down every five minutes over here. But at the same time, the system had potential that he could legit ultimately make it into the market mm -hmm. if he re-outfitted it had a couple adjustments made to it mm -hmm. made it so it was doable by american standards i think he could have legitimately entered the market mm -hmm. but no he's got to sell these ones that says has all the super nintendo games on it and do it publicly and then call out nintendo don't call out nintendo Yes. Speaking okay. of people doing <laughs> dumb stuff. <laughs> uh, oh, that reminds me. Okay, just speaking of people doing dumb stuff, this has nothing to do with the world of celebrity, but this is just uh, fun news from the last couple weeks that I saw. It was like these two girls went into Target. I don't know if you heard this or not. Hmm. These two girls went into Target and decided to steal a whole bunch of stuff. But... There was a cop, uh, well, I don't remember what they called the program, but it was something like Cops and, and Tots or something. Like, these cops had taken these local underprivileged children to Target, and they had a certain amount of budget, and they were buying Christmas presents for the kids, so the Target was full of cops. Yeah. <laughs> And the girls had actually gone up to the cops and complimented them for what they were doing. And then tried to walk out the store with a cart full of stolen merchandise. <laughs> it's like, wow. <laughs> Don't. <laughs> but my last, my last news item. I will end on a really good note. I'm happy about this. I'm very happy about hmm. this. I'm disappointed I did not get to see this film yet, and I probably will not before the Oscars. Not that it has a shot in hell of getting a nomination. Hmm. But Shout Factory has announced that they will be releasing the film Liz and the Bluebird in March. Yeah. This is cool. The reason why this is awesome and why this is newsworthy is Liz and the Bluebird is the first of two films based on the Sound Euphonium franchise. Mm. And Sound Euphonium has been released here in the States by Pony Canyon. God. Which means it's expensive as hell. So the idea that they let Shout release the movies is awesome. Who knows, maybe they'll give up on awesome. that thing. Awesome. Save yes. money and just uh, and just say, okay, yes. you can sell our stuff overseas. I really want to see this franchise. It's supposed to be really good. But if nothing else, I can at least watch the first movie and argue. I would imagine the second one. If they're getting one, they'll probably get both of them. But yeah, yeah, 
I really want Silent Voice to finally get released. It is finally getting a theatrical re-release, which will probably be followed by a release. Yeah, we'll hopefully. See. Well, we'll, we can we'll hope. see. We can hope. Actually, no, the theatrical release, isn't that like in two weeks? It's not very long from now. Oh, I need to find out when that is. Hmm. So okay. uh, let's. Uh, so we thought we would end this with. Uh, we've all watched Speaking of some good movies. Fun, uh, some fun over there. You've watched Great uh, like thirty four. What this year? 34? Thirty four. Thirty three movies. 33. I have watched. Uh, I guess since I I can't count Mary and the Witch's Flower, I've watched thirteen right. total films released in two thousand eighteen. Yeah. Released here in two thousand eighteen because some of those uh, like mm. fireworks and. Uh, uh, and Night of Short Walk on Girl were released in Japan in 2017. They were, weren't they? Yep. But and, but they were released here in 2018, right. and that's really what counts. Mary and the Witch's Flower got its proper release here last year, but it was released limitedly the year before to qualify yeah. for Oscar. And you know, yeah. So we got together and we yeah. we picked out ten films that we just thought would be fun to talk about. Yep. Uh, as a reflection of the year, and since. Yeah. There's only three on the on the list that you've seen that I haven't. Why don't we go over those first? Okay. And then we'll move on to the others. Uh, hopefully this won't be too terribly redundant, but I did include two documentaries on here. Mm -hmm. There are... It was a really big year for so-called biodocs. Um, and I have seen two of the... Well, I've seen three of them. And two of them we want to mention here because they're going to be front runners in the Oscar race. Oh, yeah. Um, Won't You Be My Neighbor, the uh, uh, Mr. Rogers, Fred Rogers documentary I actually got to see in theaters. Really, really, really well done movie. Very interesting. I grew up with Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood. I came within a hair's breadth of having him as my commencement speaker. I'm so annoyed that didn't happen. It was... Um, it was a really good movie. It was really well done for a man who, as far as I know, you know, knock on wood, he's one of those celebrities that uh, has not been painted as, um, well, some people have tried to paint him with uh, negative connotations, you know. but They haven't been successful yet. Though. They haven't been successful, but there are a lot of people who believe that he is to blame for the the the, the whole... You know, even though he was a staunchly conservative, most pe mostly it's the conservatives that have an issue with him. The whole love everybody thing is apparently a problem. Yeah, you know, yeah. It, it's a terrible thing yeah. to actually love your neighbor. Yeah, and, I know. You know. But it was a really well done movie, it was, and, it, and I was very much enjoyed it. And um, RBG, the documentary about Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Uh, well, conservatives so definitely don't like her. The so-called uh, <laughs> notorious RBG, who lived up to her name in the last couple weeks. She was in the hospital for uh, the re uh, removal of a couple of cancerous nodes. And while in the hospital cast a vote on a uh, on a case i'm like that's that's some serious work ethic there you know so uh yeah, she just it, stubborn <laughs> she is stubborn she has stated that she will retire when she can no longer do the job and so that's like yeah. um but it's a very interesting documentary she's a very interesting individual there's also a movie that just came out uh based on her early years called on the basis of sex which uh, I still need to see eventually. Is it um, is it Haley Atwell that's in that one? I'm not sure on that one. I don't remember offhand, but um, I do want to see that. But RBG, both of those are excellent documentaries mm -hmm. and very much worth a viewing. And one that felt like a documentary, right down to perfectly capturing the absolute agony of being that age, was the film Eighth Grade for which Elsie Fisher got a shocking but well-deserved Golden Globe nomination. Um, the film basically is about a girl who is finishing her 8th grade year, desperately wants to reinvent herself once high school starts, and is, you know, that's pretty much it. There's not really necessarily a huge plot involved. Mm -hmm. It's basically a coming-of-age movie, um... But really well done. Really naturalistic performances. Very 
Uh, it just it feels like a documentary in a lot of ways, and um, just really well done. Like I said, extremely awkward and a little painful to watch, but you know, yeah, yeah. kind of like your typical no Bombach movie, but better. <laughs> Well, yeah. I guess we'll just go uh, back to back. We'll just go okay. back from the seven back. There's no particular order or rhyme or reason. Yeah. Just ten that we thought would be fun to have on here. Yeah. Uh, one I watched last night, so I, it's very fresh in my mind. <laughs> my wife has watched it like three times or more. I saw it and, in theaters uh, over the summer. <laughs> that's Crazy Rich Asians, mm-hmm. which proves that an all-Asian cast, or mostly all-Asian mm-hmm. cast, can still be a very profitable venture. Oh yeah, it is a uh, it is a romantic comedy uh, where this couple goes back to Singapore, mm-hmm. which is the home of the uh, of the male character, mm-hmm. main character, and he's going back to celebrate the wedding of was it his sister or is his bro- his cousin his cousin yes yeah and. Uh, he brings back the, his his uh, well his girlfriend, mm-hmm. and uh, she finds out that uh, rich Asians can be crazy. Well, she she finds <laughs> out the hard way how rich he is and how crazy his family is. Yes, <laughs> and you, know, you mentioned uh, the sister. The sister is one of the more uh, colorful characters. I thought it's. Uh, but, um, but you know they are. It is a good film. It's very well written, mm-hmm. very well acted, and uh, they are set up for the sequels Phenom- to try and follow the books, which I need to read. Phenomenal use of music, the, and um, I love. I yeah. absolutely love how they made a point to find people on YouTube to use on the soundtrack. Hmm. I think that was awesome that they did that. And one of them, who I have a subscription to her channel, and I've mentioned on here, Kina Granis, actually shows up in the wedding scene uh, performing a cover of an Elvis song. Um, And actually, I found out over Christmas that she toured in the eastern U.S. (laughs) The weekend that I went to see the film, she was in Atlanta and Nashville, where you know I have family in both places, and I'm like... Man, man, I didn't even know who she was at the time. But um, <laughs> did you see the uh, Glee cameo at the end? The um, yeah, uh, other the, Asian, uh, yeah, Harry, <laughs> what Harry Shum, yeah. right? Harry Shum Jr. Yeah, he ended up yeah. being a. That was at the. Well, he's uh, I think he co-stars in the in one of the later or both of the later films. Yeah. Um, they were kind of planting him in there, mm-hmm. um, and then of course the star of the film, Constance Wu, is from our hometown, so that's really cool, and she did a great job. But um, um, I mean, there are some criticisms yeah. like, yeah. this person isn't Asian enough, or they're not the <laughs> right Asian. But you know, f- first off, this is a major Hollywood film. Yeah. And the fact that you've got a major Hollywood film yeah. not whitewashing characters, yeah. Scarlett Johansson was nowhere to be seen in this film. Yes. <laughs> the now, uh, it's it's rare that you yes. get enough uh, beauty on screen that I will see that as uh, not at all a debit. But you know. Um, but one thing I will mention is as well is not just you know not not just all the the pretty Asians, but the uh, they the this film could also be a front runner in the costume category oh, and in beautiful. the production design. This yes. is a gorgeous film. I would not um, be surprised. To, it's going to get some Oscar nods. Right. I just don't know what it'll get win wise. Right. Um, but uh, I was going to also say you, you've heard about the second film is delayed. Ah. Uh, it's going to be after 2020, and the reason for that is they. This is the sad thing: is that they looked, they did not think that a uh, that a cast that's m- mostly minority would uh, be able to be successful. So they thought it was going to be the end. So they didn't bother. So they need to they get everyone signed, together, and yeah, they didn't. They they signed the main characters right. just in case to multi film, but they didn't bother with any of the side characters, thinking it was going to flop. Ah. So and that was a big cast. <laughs> so since it uh, didn't, they've got to get them all back, yeah. and they've all got other projects in 2019. So uh, it's going to be after 2020, but there is a sequel incoming. Isn't that something? <laughs> well, and they build it as the first like Asian-led American production since Joy Luck Club. I'm not sure if that was 100% accurate, but it does show that this is a rarity and it's something that hopefully will turn around and change. 
Um, speaking of uh, overlooked uh, stuff involving Asians, the this was a banner year for anime, I think. And mm -hmm. we had some really interesting ones. And two of them actually have a chance, a chance yeah. at Oscar and Love. And one of them is a film by... Uh, by uh, you want to say, is it you want to say uh, yeah. you no Masaki Yuasa there we go there we go uh, you want to say it was Fushigi Yugi what was I thinking <laughs> uh, <clears throat> Masaki Yuasa who actually had two films that made their American debut this year mm -hmm. I have not yet gotten to see Lou Over the Wall but it is coming out in Shell yeah. Factory in the spring and I will get it um, and of course he was on television, uh, for those who did streaming with Devilman Crybaby. So he was all over the place this year, but we got to go see over the summer, the film Night is Short, Walk On Girl, which is one of the most singularly original films I think I've ever seen oh, in yeah. theaters. It was a very interesting, very <laughs> odd, very free flowing sort of dreamlike kind of movie. Uh, the entire <laughs> film takes over place over one night, but my God, that was a long night. Oh, <laughs> that was a very long night. And it had some very, you cannot take it literally. It really is sort of like a dream type. Oh, yeah. Um, but it was really good. It was really well done. It had phenomenal music. The, the art was great. It was just, <laughs> it was so unique and original and different. And, uh, I, you know, I mean, I'm still holding out the hope that because this will be the other one. If the Oscars do have any space for anime this year, this will be the two. this is the outside contender. If fireworks but, got no chance, though. Fireworks has no chance. Unfortunately, <laughs> Lou Over the Wall, Liz and the Bluebird, there are several that have no chance, but it's nice to know they're out there. <laughs> but um, this one was very cool, and you know. It's, Worth a look. The yeah. best thing of fire, about fireworks was that they did a preview for this film yeah. at the end, which was good because I missed the beginning of it because I was sent out for snacks. And the theme song, which was awesome. Yeah. So I do have it pre-ordered. I am going yeah. to get it. Uh, it's yeah. coming out at the end, I think, this month or next month. I can't remember. I think it's, it's the uh, end of February. But uh, I am looking forward yeah. to seeing it again. The art style is really cool mm -hmm. it's sort of a mixture of japanese animation style which it should be considering mm -hmm. it is japanese animated mm -hmm. but also in the old school american disney style as well or right. just really old school animation in general style like i wouldn't even say disney so much as like hanna barbara or something well, like that i don't know about that that's it's closer to the because hanna barbara yeah. and it's not like yogi bear or any of that no you know? not like that that's so. what i think yeah that's yeah that's hanna barbara i'm talking about like steamboat willie uh, the you know the really oh, what disney no, was i wouldn't go that far because back. uh that that sort of look though yeah a little bit it's uh, like I said. I think that it's kind of again. That's like I say. It's a combination. Yeah, of, yeah. And that's why uh, I really do like that. It's very unique. Mm -hmm. uh, Devil Man Cry Baby was hard to swallow. So I've heard. <laughs> uh, but uh, very unique looking. I love the look. Mm -hmm. So I, I will be curious mm -hmm. uh, how how it does this year i was very happy to see it and i'm glad i got to see the next one mm -hmm. which are you ready to go to the next one yeah let's go ahead all right which is mirai mm -hmm. which uh was uh, another one that we mm -hmm. went out to see and i got lucky with this uh, i think yeah. the same thing with the uh with it was this one in fireworks it came about the same way as i thought it was a one day only release which we had been getting yeah and that no it was it was the Hero Academia movie that I found uh, out, yeah. where I thought it was going to be a limited release, but they had one showing mm. over the weekend, which was a pain in the butt for My Hero Academia because it was standing room only. Right. But for Mirai, it it was reasonably decent. There wasn't it wasn't overstuffed, but it wasn't empty. Right. And uh, so it was, it was about an average was crowd, yeah. I think. Was, yeah. And Mirai is a very artistic film. Mm -hmm. uh, it's uh, a lot of themes about growing up, about mm -hmm. uh, jealousy, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, a nice spiritually, uh, not spirit, fantastic element blended in between. Mm -hmm. Animation, voice acting, 
in my opinion, out of the two, this is the one to me that leads as the one that I feel will more than likely get that nod. Well, Mirai no Mirai, uh, Mirai of the future, it's kind of redundant whatever way you look at it. Um, <laughs> some people simply call it Mirai because it's kind of yeah. redundant. Um, it, the title refer, refers to the, the main character who's, who, who's known as Kuhn, uh, whose sister is named Mirai. And it kind of starts, he's, he's a little toddler, he's a little brat. He's one of the youngest protagonists you will ever see. And that's the biggest issue with the film, is that the protagonist is a toddler. So there is a lot of yelling, there is a lot of screaming, there's a lot of brattiness, there's a lot of... But he meets a girl who is apparently his sister from the future. And he meets several other people. Basically, when he goes, out, in, when he goes out into the family <laughs> garden... And it's sort of like, you say, a, a, a fantastical, it's sort of a, he has this ability somehow to commune with people from his family at different points in their life or whatever. He ends up meeting his uh, grandfather, I believe it yes. is, as a young man. Um, there's a lot of these things, but uh, the film, it's very, very notable that the film is the new film from Mamoru Hosoda who is one of the best directors working today. Animation or not, he is one of the best directors working today. And he founded a, co-founded a small studio, Studio Chizu. This is the third film that he has put out through Chizu. And it's very much about family. It's very everything related to family. Like yeah. you said, jealousy and uh, also just the, the process of... You know, the the main character is this little brat, but his parents get a ton of screen time, too. And you really get to learn about... One of the people he meets is his mother is a little child, which is kind of an interesting yeah. uh, thing. And <laughs> it's it's really a fun movie. It does, yeah. you, You've got to have some tolerance for the yelling. It's, uh, but is... it's a beautiful film. There's wonderful music. It's wonderful animation. And I have long maintained that Hosoda's film Summer Wars was a hair's breadth from getting an Oscar nod. But because of the rules that year, they could only have three nominees. I have long maintained that if they could have had five, they needed one more animated film, they would have had five. Yeah. And I think it would have been Summer Wars Entangled. But this could very well be the first non-Ghibli film up for animated feature that's an anime and Night is Short, Walk On Girl is a dark horse. But if they both get in there, that's going to be awesome. Now, if that's I had be... to go with sheer art, yeah. Night is Short would lead for that. Right. But if you're talking about coherent story with right. artistic uh, integrity, and, Mirai is and much Mirai better. And Mirai is yeah. art of a different sort. <laughs> yes. Like, it could have been a live action, and they could have done it almost as well. Not as well, but... You know, Night is Short probably just wouldn't have worked in live There's action. There's no way you could do that live action. <laughs> maybe Terry yeah, Gilliam could pull trip. it off. Yeah, I mean... Terry Gilliam, maybe. But I think oh, was, oh, uh... that's some news from the last couple weeks. He actually has an official distribution planned for The Man Who Killed Don Quixote. Woo! Yes. Because uh, I knew that was in rights heck because that yeah. one guy was like, no, you can't do it. Yeah. So he, he, he we, we, you know, we won't know until it happens. <laughs> but, oh man, poor Terry Gilliam. But, <laughs> but uh, you know, to me, I think they're three for three in that studio. Yeah. And uh, because I've liked everything I've seen by it, I still mm -hmm. have yet to see Wolf Children. I believe that's oh, that, right. Oh, yeah, Wolf Children and The Boy and the Beast were the other two from Yeah, uh, and then Cheezer. of course, uh, um, and then... I've seen Summer Wars, yeah. which uh, was prior, and that was also an excellent film. And the girl leapt through time. Yes. And now, of course, a bit of trivia that I wonder if you know uh, what his first feature was. What was that? It was a One Piece movie. Oh, really? <laughs> I probably have it. Which movie was it? I think it was like number six. Uh, do I don't think it's... Is. No. And see, they haven't released them all. They haven't released them all. They've kind of just, all. like, randomly yeah. thrown the dice. Like, let's see, which one do it? I... Number so eight. So okay. the next one that we have from this <laughs> year is Incredibles 2. And that's the one that's going to win the yeah, category. I win. mean, it's going, to, it's going to win. But that doesn't mean nothing else will be. I'm thinking Mirai, Incredibles, 
Ralph breaks the internet, Spider-Man into the Spider-Verse. Maybe Isle of Dogs. And either Night of Short, Walk On Girl, or Isle of Dogs will get the other. Isle of Dogs has a good chance. But incred- I want to see Spider-Verse. I've heard so much heard about so it. Much. People, people are, are raving yeah. about it. Absolutely raving about it. I think that it. if there is um, one that has a chance at beating yeah. Incredibles 2, it yeah. is into the Spider-Verse. It could. Uh, it's just it's got that much yeah. of a... We're talking about minority leads. Right. Uh, that's uh, I, I really want to see that. Right. But Incredibles is good. <laughs> Incredibles is really good. They yeah. have said, Brad Bird and the other people involved said they wanted to wait until they had a story worth making, which is why they had 14 year wait. Now, a lot of people, uh, I believe you included, have said that, well, they just did the same story from the first go around. Mm. Yeah. I think they mixed it up a little bit, I, but I think with 14 years they could have gone a little yeah. more original. This is it's a rehash in some ways, but not entirely. But it's... I do think this is a series that begged for a series. Yeah, and this is definitely a worthwhile continuation of the story. Uh, the, you can definitely tell the uh, Im- improvements in animation since the first one came out. But it doesn't look so radically different that you don't want yeah. to put them side by side. Um, I, it is a wonderfully fun movie. Um, very enjoyable. I've always loved The Incredibles. Mm-hmm. That's always one of my favorites. I've always <laughs> thought The Incredibles should have a TV series. Like an That'd animated be good. series. You wouldn't even have to do a computer. You yeah. could do like a basic hand-drawn style for it. You know uh, Disney's going to do that on their streaming yeah, service. Yeah, eventually. And uh, I think that would be fine if it's written well. Yeah. I do feel that... For the time that they had, mm-hmm. they pulled a Toy Story. And <laughs> I always considered Toy Story 1 through 3 as the same story shuffled. Mm-hmm. And they brilliantly shuffle it mm-hmm. because they take the same story and make it seem like a new story. And I think that's a great thing. It takes a lot of skill. Mm-hmm. But it's still the same story. And Toy Story 4, I guarantee you, it will be the identical story to 1, 2, and 3 just slightly different to make it look different and it'll probably win an award but (laughs) i don't know it's up against frozen 2 we both of those are coming out next year so (laughs) Um, frozen was well done but uh i just don't know disney does not do well with its sequels um but uh let's see oh yeah okay I guess one dark note on Incredibles 2, it'll probably be one of the last times you see John Lasseter's name up on the screen. Oh, yeah, he left it, didn't he? Yeah. But, yeah. oh well. <laughs> um, number three, one that I believe should get a lot of Oscar love. Mm-hmm. One I saw in theaters, and I do not regret seeing this in theaters. I fought to see it in theaters. I wish I could have. And it was well worth every minute, and that's Black Klansman. Mm-hmm. Uh I have a love-hate with Spike Lee's films. Uh, traditionally, I feel like they're a bit preachy, and uh, well, maybe more than a bit. Uh, I think Spike Lee has a love-hate relationship with Spike Lee films. <laughs> but uh, but this one was very different. Mm-hmm. Um, I felt like it was one of those films that could really, really grab your audience. Mm-hmm. It really held it, and there yeah. are there are other Spike Lee films that do that, but not quite in the same way this did it had a lot of humor to it mm-hmm. it uh it was about it was based off of a true story of an individual from the police who uh one of the few first african-american uh police officers in that force and he joined the clan in order to infiltrate the clan mm-hmm. that's the central of it and it, it is a great film uh, it does poke fun at the current administration so again if this was any other type of uh, of administration, I'd say you should watch it anyway. But there's sort of a, almost I don't know a love for it, so I can't really say that that would be that this would be there. There's there's that I can't take any criticism of this person type feel. But if you can, <laughs> if you can look back and say, <laughs> okay, I get that. That's funny. Uh, this is a great film. Uh, very well done. Excellent acting. I'm hoping that uh, the lead here does get a nod at least. Mm-hmm. Uh, I hope that uh, we get nods in most places. I think it, it's adapted screenplay, or is it, uh, or is it original? 
I think it's I think adapted. It's, um, yes, I believe so. I believe the uh, the main character uh, or the main guy, uh, Ron. Uh, what's his name? I think he wrote a book based on his experience, and that was the uh, the basis for it, if I remember correctly. Now the ending though was all Spike Lee. Well, yeah, uh, yeah. That that ending was uh, all there, and uh, they even dedicated it to the the girl who died in the uh, right. Charlottesville, and that's right. fairly close to us. Uh, a mm. lot of us, we we had to go around. I was traveling around Charlottesville at that time. Really? Uh, because I was trying to do a trip home. Oh. And going home, I have to go around Charlottesville when I go back to visit family, mm. and. And uh, there were a lot of, you know, my mother-in-law letting us know, like, hey, y'all be careful. Yeah. And uh, there's a reason to be careful uh, with that. Yeah. It's, um, so, it is a, uh, it is a very poignant tale. Mm -hmm. and, and like you said, a lot of humor. And, a lot and of good really, humor. really, really solid performances. I was yes. uh, John David Washington, right, is the yes. main character's name, and then Adam Driver, of course, is the guy who's like, like he plays, he he joins the clan o over the phone. Yes, Driver plays him in person, like, which he's still he's a character that has some issues too because he's Jewish and you know the clan traditionally are not big fans of, of, <laughs> of jews either and there's one particular guy who keeps trying to trip him up and keeps like just you know just keeps <laughs> at it and keeps at it and keeps at it and of course you have Topher grace as david duke and mm -hmm. uh he does a really good job he david really... duke didn't think so <laughs> You would well. David Duke did, was was actually on the record of not liking this film at all, and, I and saying that his portrayal why. was bad. I wonder why. <laughs> I have. I can't imagine. I can't imagine. Oh, yeah, if you're a fan of David Duke, uh, <laughs> then you probably don't want to see this either. <laughs> yeah. So at any rate, um... <laughs> uh, you got the you got the biggest one. one oh, of the biggest yeah, ones of yeah, the year. Yeah. Well, well, one of them. You got the other one. I. And I guess we might as well go ahead and say together, we got yeah. Marvel at the top of the list, obviously. Yeah, I mean, there's no, so, there's no joke. I mean, y'all can yeah. figure out what the top two are. I mean, yeah, <laughs> Infinity War was a really, uh, Avengers Infinity War, the first half of two, when they originally announced it, they said it was going to be a two-parter, and then they kind of backpedaled on it and said, no, we're doing separate movies. And then everyone went to see it and said, wait, wait, what the hell, man? And it's like, well, it's the first half of the movie. And it's like, okay, y'all really dropped the ball on your branding here, on your uh, messaging here. It's like, <sighs> but Infinity War is the first half. Endgame comes out in a couple of months, and that's going to be the end of the first big, big part of Marvel cinema yeah i think it's you're going to see a lot of actors retiring their roles yeah. and uh, new actors taking on yep. those roles or or Co different versions of them not so coincidentally about the same time that fox is coming into the yes. fold um but at any rate it is a the reason i harp on that is if you somehow have not yet seen the film be prepared for a cliffhanger oh yeah be prepared for a cliffhanger. <laughs> uh, you know, it actually strikes me. I mean, the reaction to the ending of this tells me yeah. a lot about who watches this. It yeah. shows me this is not a... this. Is, Marvel movies are not yeah. for necessarily people who love comic books. The comic crowd knew what to yeah. expect. So many people saw this that have never even heard of the Infinity Gauntlet comic. I mean, most it's of like, us who've read the comics are like, yeah, I know it's coming. Yeah. <laughs> and they did change it dramatically. And I will oh, say yeah. this. They changed the simple change of Thanos' goals and his motivations. Well, they changed Thanos almost they entirely. They changed him almost entirely, but it was all for the better. Oh, yeah. He was a wonderful villain. The Thanos in the comics was, eh. <laughs> it's this is yeah. why I, I don't know how it's going to end yeah because the way that they beat him in the comics and this is not a big spoiler for the movies because yeah. they can't do it this way thanos yeah. got such a swelled head he kept getting more powerful to the point where he surrendered the gauntlet yeah 
and and Nebula grabbed it from him. <laughs> right. And then then he had to join forces with the Avengers to take down Nebula. <laughs> and not only that, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> if I recall correctly, I do believe that certain of the individuals who went poof in the movie were actively involved in the in the initial fix. Not to mention that uh, certain characters mm-hmm. factored heavily that do depend on Fox coming into the fold. Yeah. Doctor Doom was a big part of the comic, um, the Fantastic Four. We'll see. Well, but we'll I see will say this. I we, ha- we do know from the early trailers that I was right. Hawkeye will star in the second one. I still joke that he will be the one to fix everything, but... <laughs> And Miss Marvel is going to be uh, a prominent, and her Ms. movie Marvel, comes out first, right? Yes, Miss Marvel comes out, and Endgame comes out like a month and a half later, so it'll be oh, yeah. pretty interesting. There's a there's a fan rumor that she is stuck in the quantum realm, and she will get Scott Lang out of the quantum realm. Small spoiler there, but uh, if that is true, that'll be pretty cool. I wonder if Adam um, Warlock's going to factor into this. Uh, Warlock has been placed in the continuity so yeah it'll be interesting to see if he uh, comes in because uh, um, uh so and of course of course they do have howard the duck already in there oh yeah, yeah i mean he's the biggest one at all <laughs> yes. he, he he goes on he in the comics he faces yes. for those of you who don't read the comics i'll fill you in there's a big one-on-one howard the duck versus thanos and he almost beats thanos he takes the glove but thanos tricks him and takes the glove back and that, that's, how, that's how it really plays Actually, out. Actually, it's <laughs> funny you say that because he is friends with Squirrel Girl and she has taken down some pretty big people. Yeah, well, Dazzler <laughs> took down Galactus. Yeah, well, so did Squirrel Girl. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. anyway. <laughs> but yeah. Infinity War, definitely, it's mm-hmm. beautiful. It's very well done. They, oh, yes. did, they did top-notch production value. It, it should be up for visual effects. There's so much that they really brought their A game to doing that. There are some plot holes. There are some things they left out. I am very, 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 very peeved at the fact that there is no mention of Tessa Thompson's Valkyrie anywhere in the film. Yeah, that's kind of weird because there, the, how prominent she was in the Yes. Era. Now, there is the implication that half of Asgard is still around. But yes. it doesn't look that way in the film. It looks like it destroyed all yes. of it. <laughs> yes. So we shall see. Um, otherwise, this was Thompson's year. I'm just going to go ahead oh, and yeah. mention she was in Sorry to Bother You, Creed 2. She had a big year going on. So it was even weirder that she wasn't in there. But <laughs> Well, finally, you can't yeah. mention films without mentioning Black Panther. Exactly. Uh, well, One of the few films with a lot of black people in it that she was not in this. Year. And this is we talked about we talked about Crazy Rich Asians, yeah. and this is this is another. I mean, to me, this is in a way the same thing, but you know, with an African American yeah. cast. I mean, and everyone the was shows like, that it did... can be that good. I'll admit, I was taken aback by how much money this made. Oh, but yes. this was another one where the studios were hedging their bets. They just they didn't think it was going they to do didn't very think much. it would yeah it's and it's what the third highest grossing domestic film ever or something yeah, like that well, that's the thing it's, that's it's, like, and it, and nowadays people aren't going and saying well they're not white so I can't bother to see it <laughs> no it's that the, they're seeing a film because of the film's merits alone Black Panther race I think does play a part because it's what it represents they did have the token like. <laughs> It, yeah, they did. They did have a token white guy the in it. Token, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but it was it was a beautifully done movie. Yes, phenomenal score. And and uh, was it Ludwig Göransson? I think is his name is getting tons of praise for and the costume score. Design really costume impressive. design was costume design was yes, very yeah. very impressive. The um, uh, the uh, the song "All the Stars" is probably going to clean up a whole bunch of awards. Yeah. Um, I was very pleased. I was very pleased to find mm-hmm. out that they actually involved uh, Baba Mall on the soundtrack. I'm a, mm-hmm. I'm a big fan of his, so that was really cool to see and, uh, that he was in there. And to me, um, I don't know if it's going to get a lot of Oscar love, mainly. Mm-hmm. It might get technical, but I don't think it's going to get... Well, it's, it's, going it's to debatable get a fair bit. because it's just uh, that way, but the Oscars traditionally hate superhero movies. Yeah. They don't take them seriously. 
which is a real shame. I'm just I'm just waiting. I'm just praying for and like to see the nominations and we'll see them dominated by Black Panther, Crazy Rich Asians, Mirai of the Future, Night of Short Walk On Girl. Um, we're going to see, um, what are we going to see that's really uh, off the beaten path for them? This is Into the Spider-Verse, <coughs> and we're going to see all these um, Ant-Man and the Wasp going to sneak yeah, in there with a couple things. And then, uh, well, let's not forget horror. We haven't really done horror here, but this was a big year for horror. Oh, and we got A Quiet Place, and we got uh, oh, Halloween. Box even with that, and, too. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's going to be yeah. interesting how it goes this time. Yeah. Uh, with Black Panther, they tried. You could tell that they were trying to uh, segregate it out. Kind of interesting we use segregation with Black Panther, but yeah, they tried to segregate it to an award that they made specifically for oh, it. Oh, jeez, the popular audience. Oh, uh, they backpedaled on this so they fast. They backpedaled on it because that was just kind of. <sighs> It's... We do need a few more Oscar categories, but we don't need that one. That was so, a stupid idea. It, it was their way of saying we don't want to nominate it because we're too snobby, but uh, <sighs> this way we can nominate it for something and not nominate it. Sort of like how they created the animated feature. is <sighs> So we can nominate films that we don't want to nominate and uh, we can still keep our snobby integrity. Uh, uh, yeah. Well, okay, well, let's look just real quick at some of the possible categories. Vocal acting, Isle of Dogs would be a wonderful contender for that. Mm -hmm. You know, um, Incredibles 2, yeah. uh, Into the Spider-Verse, from what I've heard. Um, Mirai of the Future, probably. Um, you got the uh, use of music in film. Night of Short Walk On Girl, my God. Crazy Rich Asians, Black Panther, Infinity War, Ant-Man. All of those phenomenal use of music. Blank Klansman was pretty darn good with the use of music. Um, you know, there, there's so many. Uh, eighth Grade was good with the use of music. Um, then you get, uh, what were some of the other ones that I'd like to see? The, um, oh, that musical. What was it, the best uh, arranged score? What was no, it? no. Uh, um, the, uh, okay, I'm drawing a blank for some reason. I'd like the cameo, a cameo role yeah. would be another interesting one. But, um... <laughs> The, uh, but anyway, that's enough of that for but, now. Uh, um, I'm not looking forward to the changes because, uh, mm -hmm. I mean, they're going to shorten it. They're going to, yeah. they're going to leave out categories. You're going to have to look online oh, to find right. out who wins. They're not, they're not telecasting everything anymore. Yeah, that's gonna, stupid. That's stupid. You're going to have to look online to find out who wins stuff. Um, because yeah. they're going to do some of the awards during the commercials. Yeah, no, that's uh, just not right. So uh, we got to do research to see out where they're updating that live. Or maybe there's yeah. a live feed that we can hook on to. There probably will be a live feed, and it'll probably be just like before, where if you're not in certain cities or paying for a service... Yeah, cable. You, you know. our cable went out. Yeah. On the Oscar night. Oh, yeah. That, that does a... Uh, let's hope it doesn't this time. Yeah. But uh, it just does... Uh, but Black Panther... To me, Black Panther is not about the movie itself. The movie as a whole is a solid film. Mm -hmm. The CG is probably the weakest point of it. Like that fight at the end. And it's not bad. It's not bad, no. but it's. But if you compare it to like Infinity War. Yeah. I mean, if you were to put those two up, like best CG, uh, Infinity War versus Black Panther in the award, mm -hmm. Infinity War would get it. Uh, no doubt. Uh, yeah. I feel like that if they had taken the movie more seriously, any of these little quirks would have been ironed out, and it would be like, um, mm -hmm. and it would be nearly a perfect <clears throat> superhero film. Mm -hmm. And again, though, it's about what it represents. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is something that it, that shows that yes, it's the story, not who your lead is. That's important. And we've seen mm -hmm. a lot of prominent women take on this story. When Wonder Woman last year mm -hmm. was a kick-butt film, and right. you didn't need any male lead. Right. And actually, that's um, one of the things we're looking forward to with Captain Marvel, which will be the first Marvel film led by a female. Yep. Ant-Man and the Wasp was the first one with a female in the title. And I would say uh, Hope... It's still more Scott Lang's story than Hope Van Dyne, but they are pretty close in screen time. Um, she gets a lot more screen time, for sure, by far, than she did the first movie. 
and she does get to kick ass and take names, which she didn't really do too much first go around. And there may be a um, Black Widow movie still in the works. In the and then and let's not forget one of the reasons I really want to see Into <laughs> the Spider Verse is Spider Woman, aka Spider Gwen, yeah. who is an alternate reality version of Gwen Stacy. I have read the Spider Gwen comics up to a point, <laughs> and they're pretty flippin' awesome. She is a great character. This world, Spider Woman is her mentor, and she flips back and forth between dimensions and whatever. But I actually, a patron at the library, actually was raving about the film, and I told him how much I wanted to see Spider Gwen. And he's like, yeah, she was great. And I was like, yeah, the comics are so great. And he's like, you have the comics? I was like, yeah. And he's like, he went immediately went to check them out. <laughs> and it's like, but um, she and Miles Morales is a fun character too. And you're talking about, you know, diversity and whatever. Um, they do have several different people in the Spider-Verse. Oh, yes. And people are raving about this version of Peter Parker, but they're also thrilled that they're getting to see these alternate characters as well. And mm -hmm. and I can't wait to see Gwen Stacy on the screen in you know in this role. Yeah, I, yeah. I do think that if anybody yeah. can kick Pixar off their throne, I used to say yeah. Pixar has a lock, but Cars yeah. prove that Pixar cannot hold the lock, uh, but or sometimes even get nominated. Uh, but uh, it's. But that's the thing, though. Uh, it can be Pixar can be taken down. Oh, they Incredibles can. Incredibles two. They're already guaranteed a, a slot for Toy Story four. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> Incredibles two is probably going to be the winner. It's still, it's you know, everybody else is going to be David versus Goliath on yeah. it because it is a mainstream Pixar film. This is not Cars two. This is not Cars three. This is not even Cars. This but is currently. Yes. I, well, I, I need to double-check Incredibles 2. But currently, there's only about four films from the year that are on IMDb's Top 250. Uh, and Into the Spider-Verse is the, the highest ranked. Yeah, like I said, and then there's, there's some... Infinity War and Bohemian Rhapsody, yeah. I think, is the other one. I will be finding out like at this time, but I think that if any one of them decides to does actually come and take it down... Into the Spider Verse has a good shot. So we need to go see it next week. <laughs> It'd be nice. <laughs> I do have it on pre order, so ah. I, it will be it will be mine. Oh yes. <laughs> oh yes. <it> will. <laughs> well with that we've had a long one this time, but right. uh, next time it won't be as long. But right. uh, I hope you've had a wonderful new year and uh, or, or, or will or be if you're be. actually watching this before midnight. Because this is gonna be uploaded uh, pretty much I'm going to upload it. Uh, right after we finish this recording. So, All right. Uh, so will... happy New Year. Happy New Year to yeah. you. Goodbye. Goodbye.